let's go back to history, you can see these gravestones are essentially very similar to each other. And that is because most of the people died uh, very soon, one after the other. Now, previous to that, in, in the, 18th and, uh, the 17th and 18th century, we had the slave trip. The terrible conditions of the slaves aboard ships, uh, Africans who were essentially uh, traded from inland in areas where yellow fever is endemic. The water storage on ships in, in, in barrels of water was quite clearly contaminated, was, was infested by mosquitoes. These mosquitoes loved to live in water in water barrels. The virus was on board, and so of course there were terrible uh, epidemics even on board, and ships had to be quarantined for yellow fever, hence the yellow quarantine flag. And as you know, there was this the triangular trade from, from Europe down to, uh, to Africa where they exchanged knives, etc., for humans. The humans were transmitted across to the New World and they brought with them yellow fever. And you can see where the yellow fever outbreaks occurred. Just like chikungunya, they occurred also wherever the summer temperatures allowed transmission. And you can see Dublin and Cardiff and, and Boston and here in New York. In other words, places that are not too tropical. The biggest outbreak occurred in Memphis. And that cemetery has a mound uh, with 6,000 people, a mass burial of people who died of yellow fever. And as you can see, the, 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 the virus was transmitted uh, all over the place. I'm going to move to malaria now, and I'm going to make three points. First of all, I'm going to look at, at I'm going to make three points that are made by the alarmists, by the activists, in relation to malaria. First of all, that malaria will come to temperate regions. Uh, then there will be up to 500 million more cases in Africa, and that the disease is, is spreading to higher altitudes. And the, the IPCC are saying that, uh, that malaria is limited to the tropics and subtropics. Well, this is the area where we had chikungunya transmission. Uh, you can see the meandering river through the village uh, and, and the flat field. This is a very flat area. It is the delta of the Po Valley, one of the most malarious places in Europe uh, in, until the beginning of the uh, middle of the 20th century, round, round about the 1950s. But in fact, malaria was not limited to the Mediterranean. Uh, we in Britain built <coughs> our Houses of Parliament in a malaria swamp. Um, it, it was cheap land. And your president, or whoever it was who, who, who selected uh, where the offices of government are, he followed British parliamentary president <laughs> by putting your offices also in a malaria swamp. This is the distribution of malaria in the United States over, over several years. You can see it stops at the 49th parallel. That is actually not true. There was malaria in Canada as well. In, the, in Europe, we had the Little Ice Age. Uh, this is a painting that was painted in, uh, in 1564, 65, the beginning of some of the coldest years when the king, the king used to go skating on the Thames. Uh, there were many times that the Thames uh, was frozen over. I have many quotes that I found, I enjoy doing this, finding quotes in the literature um, of the ague, which was malaria, associated with brackish water marshes. And here is one from, from the, the Tempest, where um, uh, uh, Sebastian is terrified because he sees this uh, very strange creature, Caliban. Caliban realizes that he's probably got an ague. Uh, he's in his fit now, he doesn't talk after the wisest and then he'll give him alcohol. People used to give alcohol to at least allay some of the symptoms of, of malaria. William Harvey, I found to my surprise, had actually probably was the first person to demonstrate or to observe the changes in the consistency of the blood that occur in severe malaria, what we call uh, uh, cerebral malaria, where the capillaries get blocked up. And as he says, uh, the blood is forced into the lungs and rendered thick, exactly what happens the, the, the erythrocytes get stuck together. As I myself have seen in opening the bodies, his hospital was St. Thomas's Hospital, right opposite the Houses of Parliament. And a wonderful woman, Mary Dobson, uh, <coughs> supplied uh, <coughs> data on mortality in parishes, marsh parishes and non-marsh parishes, and you can see tremendously high mortality, which was directly attributable to, the, to, to, to malaria, the bad air of the marshes. 
A man called Robert Talbor was the first to produce a really good malarial, anti-malarial therapy, uh, even in Europe, with, uh, with uh, quinine in white wine. This is uh, his book on the causes, his ideas of the causes um, of agues, of malaria. Uh, and he, he actually became rich and famous, uh, curing the aristocracy all over Europe, particularly, for example, the Tsar in St. Petersburg, which was a notoriously malarious city. Here you see some graphs of the distribution of malaria in, fin in Sweden. Finland was also very heavily affected, uh, and there was even transmission in Lapland. Uh, this was a very interesting thing I found in a book by Daniel Defoe, where he saw a strange decay of the female sex uh, in, in the uh, marshlands. Basically, the men who lived in the marshlands and reared cattle there, uh, beef is supposedly very much more flavorful in, in marshland areas, uh, those people, uh, they would get wives from the hilly countries. And when they brought the wives, uh, the uh, wives were wholesome, these women were wholesome and fresh and they were healthy and clear, but they seldom lasted for a year or so and then they died of malaria. So to these men, the men would go to the uplands again and fetch another woman. Uh, so that marrying of wives was reckoned a kind of good farm for them. So uh, that was what, uh, the very last thing I'll say about malaria in temperate regions is that the, one of the biggest epidemics of all time on record was in the Soviet Union in, the, in 23, 25, during the fantastic uh, uh, civil wars that were going on. And um, we had even, they had uh, 30,000 cases in Archangel, which is close to the Arctic Circle. So I think you should be convinced that we're not dealing with a tropical disease exclusively. Now I move on to uh, the claim that there will be perhaps 500 million more cases in, 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 of malaria in Africa. Very, very quickly, I must distinguish for you between stable and unstable malaria. In, in many areas, stable malaria means that everybody gets infected by, inf uh, gets bitten by infected mosquitoes at least once a year. That's roughly uh, uh, a stable malaria. Meaning that everybody who is not immune, the newcomers, the, the children, and uh, perhaps uh, people from, t from regions where there's no longer uh, malaria, um, they uh, are the, the, those people are susceptible. The people that have survived malaria have a certain degree of immunity, and their re immunity is renewed every year. Unstable areas, transmission is very irregular. There may be years, several years, many years. It's very difficult to predict when there is no transmission. In which cases we have, uh, when the malaria comes, then you can have devastating ep epidemics. This is a map of Africa produced by a group partly financed by the World Health Organization. The areas in red are areas of stable transmission. In other words, those areas are perfectly okay for transmission to everybody every year. So where are the areas where there may be changes with changing climate? They are the fringe areas there. Uh, when the environmentalists talk about the advance of desertification, then we can imagine that that northern border will move southwards. In other words, there will be uh, epidemic malaria in that thin band of area, probably. But look, the majority of Africa already, the glass is full. You can't have any more uh, water in a glass if it's full. You pour water in and it pours over the edge.